or anything from politics to uh, uh, junk mail. Well, Conor O'Clary of the Irish Times, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. We're now going to take a look at more extended excerpts from the Irish Doyle and the October 16th through 18th debate on the no-confidence motion on the Prime Minister. I move the, the motion uh, number 12, Count Corley, that this House reaffirms its confidence in the government. I believe this government merits the confidence of Dáil Éireann on the basis of our record in managing the nation's affairs and our programme for the future. I propose to outline the government's record on performance and our plans for the future within the general framework of economic and social policy, European affairs and the competence and quality of our administration. My colleagues during the course of the debate will outline their performance and plans in more detail in respect of their particular areas of responsibility. In order to assess our management of the economy and the public finances, it is necessary to look back to the situation that confronted this nation when we took office in early 1987. Let me remind everyone in this House, and there are many of those on those benches over there who want to forget it, of the perilous state of the economy and the public finances at the end of 1986. The national economy was in decline, with negative growth in the previous four years. The public finances had deteriorated to the extent that the current budget deficit was the highest ever recorded of 8.3% of GNP. The national debt had been virtually doubled in four years. The enormous burden of taxation had become intolerable. Taxes had been increased in real terms by nearly £600 million between 1982 and 1986. Confidence in the economy at the end of 1986 had vanished, and real interest rates were at exorbitant levels. Industrial investment had collapsed. There was a chronic balance on, chronic balance on our balance of payments. Our external reserves at the end of 1986 had fallen to a dangerous level. The effect of this massive deterioration in our economy its stability and competitiveness was most clearly marked in an enormous loss of employment. Between 1982 and 1986, total employment fell by 66,000, one of the largest such losses of employment ever experienced in our recent history. That is the disastrous record of the Fine Gael Labour Coalition, of which Deputy Bruton, Deputy Barry, Deputy Deasy, Deputy Noonan and Deputy Spring were all members. Deputy John Bruton, as Minister of Finance, ended up with the highest current budget deficit on record in this country. He unilaterally devalued our currency in 1986, only three months after an EMS realignment. Deputy Bruton, as Minister of Finance, brought us as near to third world status as we have ever been. <laughs> the, situation, the situation was so bad in 1986. The situation in 1986 was so bad that many believed it was beyond redemption. Listen, listen, listen to the record. Listen to the record. Deputies opposite. Deputies opposite have some Taoiseach, audacity. Taoiseach, permit me uh, to appeal on behalf of the chair to the House <laughs> that we're embarking on uh, what is regarded as a very important debate. And the chair would hope that we would endure or enjoy each other in silence. The Taoiseach, without interruption, please. As usual, as usual, Count Corla, I will listen. As usual, Count Corla, I will listen, will listen courteously and politely to what everybody else has to say. The deputies offered us have some audacity after the way they devastated the Irish economy and our public finances, even to participate in this debate. It was a depressing, intimidating and almost hopeless scene that confronted us in 1987. But we took firm control of the situation. We set about the tough task of putting the public finances in order and generating economic growth. To the extent to which we succeeded can be judged from the fact that by 1990 the economy had been transformed. Our achievements since 1987 have received wide praise from objective external commentators and are regarded as something of a model of non-inflationary growth which others could well in in imitate. No other community country achieved the same degree of improvement in the fundamentals of the economy as we did in the period since 1986. Most fundamental of all, growth was restored to the economy. 
We have had since 1986 a sustained period of growth averaging 4.5% a year as confidence was restored and investment and production increased. By 1990, the public finances were fundamentally transformed. The Exchequer borrowing requirement fell from 128 to 2% 2 of GNP in 1990. The current budget deficit was brought down from a record 8.3% of GNP to 0.7%. Total government expenditure was reduced from 55% of GNP in 1986 to 41% in 1990. Revenue was reduced from 40% of GNP in 84-86 to 36.6% in 1990. These dramatic improvements in the fundamental structure of the Exchequer finances were brought about by firm, skilled and courageous management of the public finances. Many difficult and unpopular decisions had to be made. We made them. Many sacrifices had to be demanded from various sections of our community. They responded generously in the national interest. It is necessary to remind deputies opposite that this economy was hauled back by Fianna Fáil from the brink of the bankruptcy to which had been brought in December 1986 by Deputy Bruton of Fine Gael and Deputy Spring of Labour. Under this government and their predecessors, the turnaround was dramatic. We have now had a current balance of payment surplus since 1987, giving unprecedented stability to our exchange rate. Our competitive position has vastly improved. Irish firms throughout the country can now compete in a way they never knew before. The effect of the improvement in the economy was a rise in employment of 40,000 between 1987 and 1990. And we have every reason to believe that those additional jobs are being maintained even in today's most difficult circumstances. Yet Deputies Bruton, Barry, Deasy, Noonan, Spring want this House to express no confidence in a government which has transformed the Irish economy from the near bankrupt state in which they left it. The practical results of our good management of the public finances are one of the lowest inflation rates now in the community, a real relief to household budgets, lower interest rates and mortgage rates, a reduction in the standard rate of income tax from 35 to 29 per cent and in the top rate of tax from 58 to 52 per cent with many improvements in income tax allowances and exemptions, especially for the lower paid with families. The achievements and progress made in all aspects of the economy and the public finances since 1987 must convince any impartial observer that the affairs of the state are best left in the hands of those who achieve these dramatic improvements that I have outlined. What cannot be contemplated is a return of the economy and our public finances to the irresponsible and incompetent care of those from who from 1982 to 1986 created economic and social havoc in this country. The great departure in Irish affairs made by this government and their predecessors has been in the radical new way of managing our economic and social affairs that we have established. When we came into office in 1987, we invited the trade unions, the employers and the farmers to join us in formulating the programme for national recovery. We were determined to replace confrontation by consensus. A small society like ours, living on a peripheral island and dependent for our living standards on international markets, can succeed only if all major economic and social interests are prepared to combine with the government in an agreed programme of economic and social development. That is a self-evident truth, which I hope, now that it has been established, will never again be forgotten or ignored. The approach we have adopted is now the envy of the social partners in other community countries, particularly when they see the results it has achieved in transforming the economy here since 1986. It has made us into a low inflation country and brought a truly remarkable period of industrial peace. These achievements have only been possible because of the willingness of the social partners in the national interest to combine together with the government and accept the sacrifices and disciplines that were necessary to bring about the changes that were made. This year has brought major difficulties. For the first time since 1987, the international economy has suffered a setback and entered a period of difficulty and recession. Two of our most important trading partners, the US and the UK, went into outright recession with output and employment falling. This had a serious effect on our economic performance and prospects though not to the same extent as others have suffered. 
In our own case, we had in common with other community countries based our budget on a higher growth rate than can now be achieved. The growth forecast of 2.25% on which the budget was based was in line with forecasts for Ireland by the EC Commission last December. Other published forecasts were broadly in line. Deputies will recall, however, that both I and the Minister of Finance stressed at budget time the difficult and uncertain international background against which this year's economic and budgetary policies had to be framed. Since January, virtually all the major forecasters have scaled back their forecast for growth. The OECD scaled back its forecast for the world growth in 1991 from 2% to 1%. The Commission scaled back its forecast of growth in the community from 2.2% to 1.4%. Everyone should understand that we are not alone in having to take action to adapt to circumstances which have changed for the worse. All the community countries are having to do the same. That our hopes and projections of last January will not be realised cannot be grounds for blame. What we could be blamed for would be if we did not quickly identify our problems and take strong corrective action. And that is exactly what we are doing. Let me give an outline of what has been happening and what we are doing about it. Growth in our economy fell away, bringing a corresponding decline in government revenues. Because of conditions in the US and the UK, emigration ceased and many of our immigrants have returned. Their welcome return increased greatly the number of unemployed on the live register, giving rise to a major increase in expenditure for social welfare. As early as last July, we took action to curb the deterioration in the public finances by cutting government expenditure by £100 million, million this year. Even though we did so, the government's borrowing this year will rise to 2.5% of GNP instead of the 1.9% that we had hoped for. While this is disappointing, it is not disastrous. In no way does it reflect on the authenticity of this year's budget and any suggestion to that effect are simply not valid. The combination of factors that cause the deterioration in this year's finances have been clearly identified for all to see and to understand. They are a result, the result of the realities we have to face. Despite this deterioration this year, we still have one of the lowest exchequer deficits in the community and our national debt GNP will decline again this year. Let me remind Deputies Bruton, DC, Barry, Noonan and Spring that the national debt GNP ratio when they were in office rose from 94% to 129%. For them to attempt to lecture anyone on the management of the public finances is like listening to a lecture by the Emperor Nero to the ancient Romans on firefighting. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, despite lower growth this year, all... That's what you like. That's what you like. That's what you like. I'll deal with you later. I'll deal with you later. I've dealt with you before. I'll deal with you again. Fortunately, fortunately, despite growth, lower growth this year, all the indications and estimates from commentators are that employment has remained stable this year. This is a clear indicator of the basically sound underlying state of our economy that it has now achieved. Due to this firm foundation, our inflation rate, our interest rates and our balance of payments have all been kept under control and we are ready to benefit from the growth in international trade now forecast generally to occur this year. Our present assessment is, however, that growth next year will be less than we had been looking forward to. For the immediate future, we must accept that economic growth is likely to be modest rather than spectacular. International agencies now predict that growth will return slowly but steadily in the UK and the US in the second half of 1991 and will accelerate in 1992. On balance, therefore, international developments should assist some pickup in our economy in the months ahead. We can therefore hope for a more satisfactory growth rate next year, particularly for consumer spending. This has special e implications for the Exchequer finances. The lower than expected growth next year, coming on top of lower than expected growth this year, 
will mean less exchequer revenue next year than was planned when the programme for economic and social progress was agreed. That programme was based on official estimates of average growth of 3% over the period 1991 to 1984, which were presented to all involved in the negotiations. Those rates, unfortunately, will not now be achieved. We discussed, therefore, last week with our partners in the programme the difficulties the Exchequer faces. We agreed as partners to discuss over the coming weeks the problems we face and seek to solve them. All sectors will have to contribute to this solution, and I have every confidence that given the genuine commitment of the national interest that brought us together in the first place, we will resolve the immediate and essentially short-term problems that we now face. What would be a historic tragedy, and what the economy cannot afford, is that we would relapse into the old confrontational approach to the management of this economy, in which each sector fights for its own sectional interest, regardless of the national interest, and where vital issues are settled on the picket lines or in other equally confrontational ways. The exchequer borrowing requirement for 1992 that is emerging would be greater than the already disappointing outturn for 1991. And that is not consistent with our stated policy objective and cannot be contemplated. The situation must and will be addressed. We have made too much progress since 1987 to start sliding backward now. We must continue to improve the Exchequer finances in line with the objectives set in the Programme for Economic and Social Progress. These objectives include reducing the debt GNP ratio to about 100% and achieving a broad balance in the current budget by 1993. There mu these must be reached for our own domestic reasons, but also to enable us to meet the new disciplines that will be imposed in the second stage of the forthcoming economic and monetary union. This will require us to look at all the options open to us in both the expenditure and the revenue areas of the public finances. As part of that process, we are now entering into bilateral discussions with the social partners, and the government are at the same time also engaged in a detailed, thorough examination of all areas of exchequer expenditure. These efforts are still at an early stage. However, the government are determined that the necessary steps will be taken to protect the public finances. I can therefore assure the House that the fiscal discipline which has characterised this government's dealing with the public finances will be maintained. We have all learned from the mistakes that were made in the past and for which we are still paying today when servicing the public debt takes more than three quarters of the total yield from income tax. Having gained so much ground over the past few years, we do not now propose to throw those gains away, which indeed have been very hard earned. Provided we do what is needed now, however, there is great hope for the future. Given the improvement in our economy in recent years, we are now in a good position to take advantage of the world upswing in economic activity when it gets underway. In the context of the single European market after 1992, and the opening up of markets in Eastern Europe, which should promote a substantial increase in European trade, we can benefit significantly. Over the past few years, we have been developing the potential of the economy as rapidly as possible and in every area, neglecting no opportunity for growth. This is a new, there is a new financial services industry. Many provincial towns now have international data processing industries. Many new industrial projects are coming before the government or the IDA for grant approval. We have had dynamic growth in our tourist industry, with a doubling of tourist numbers since 1986. There has been an unprecedented level of investment in new tourist amenities and facilities. The establishment of Kilte and the more than doubling of the level of forestry planting since 1986 have been a resounding success. Our marine industries are also expanding. We have given a new impetus to science and technology in the service of development. Under the National Development Plan, there has been sustained investment in our infrastructure, especially roads, ports and airports, with corresponding benefit to activity in the construction industry. In every area of this worthwhile developmental work, we will continue our efforts. We will intensify and expand them, all with the overall guiding objective 
of providing the jobs that we desperately need. The last few years also have been a period of significant social advance. Economic growth made it possible for us to do far more than was feasible in the stagnation of the mid-1980s. Major improvements have been made in the level of welfare payments, especially for the long-term unemployed with families. Education has been given special priority, with an increase in the provision of third-level places, including the new business school at Carysford. We have established a new commission on the status of women and taken action on their initial recommendations. We are also implementing a major programme of legal reform, which includes many enlightened social measures. We have been effective in bringing about social change, social reform and social improvement. Putting forward popular, high-sounding policies is easy. What counts, however, is the ability to implement, to take the hard, practical decisions, to decide difficult priorities. That is where this government shows its mettle. The cultural life of our nation is flourishing, contributing to a new, vibrant sense of national identity. Our environmental policies are working well, and there is a completely new national profile and public awareness in this important field. We are sensitive in our approach to issues, small in themselves, but nonetheless of great symbolic significance for our self-esteem as a nation. Our cities, towns and our countryside all over show many notable signs of an improved appearance. Cancorla, at EC level, we have been effective in the protection and promotion of Irish interests while contributing fully to the further integration of the community. We believe that our full membership of an increasingly integrated and developing community will enable us to exploit to the full, to the full our potential as a nation. The years past, the past years have been ones of fundamental change in European politics and present great challenges to the European community and to all its member states. Rarely in the recent history of our continent has there been such an opportunity to overcome the legacy of the past and build a stable, secure and prosperous Europe. The European community is at the centre of these efforts. It is faced with the tasks of strengthening its own internal cohesion, building new relations with its neighbours and promoting a, a more secure European order. Issues are now coming up for decision which are of enormous significance for Europe, for the European community and for this country. Developments since we joined have shown conclusively how closely Ireland's political and economic interests are intertwined with those of our European partners. We share common interests and must build a common future. That is why the Government are now involved in a series of complex and far-reaching negotiations the most complex and far-reaching since we joined the community, the outcome of which will certainly have profound effects on the future of our people and the welfare of future generations. The two intergovernmental conferences on political union and an economic and monetary union are at the heart of the community's efforts to move forward on the path to closer integration. Their general scope and objectives were settled during the Irish presidency last year and negotiations have been proceeding since then. I have kept the House fully informed of those developments throughout the negotiations, and I gave a comprehensive account of all the issues involved and of Ireland's position on them in July after the Luxembourg summit. The Treaty on Political Union will establish new forms of cooperation on foreign and security policy and on home and judicial affairs. Progress has been made but the most difficult part of the negotiations still lie ahead on such essential matters as foreign policy and security, voting, the role of the European Parliament and in particular and of very great interest to us, economic and social cohesion. Ireland's position on several of these issues has been recognised at successive European councils and incorporated in their conclusions. There is agreement that the definition of a defence policy is something for the future and the recognition that any defence identity for the Union must take account of our traditional position. The task now will be to translate these political agreements into concrete measures in the negotiations ahead. Recently we successfully opposed attempts to create a two-tier approach with regard to the move to the final stage of EMU. This is a matter of fundamental importance for the community and for Ireland. 
The strength of the community lies in its ideals of unity and coherence. A two-tier approach to either economic and monetary union or to political union would be the antithesis of everything the community stands for and is simply unacceptable. All these negotiations will reach their crucial stages in the coming months. They will require the most careful and expert handling if we are to achieve our dual aims of advancing the process of European integration and protecting and promoting Ireland's best interest in all areas. The government, this government, have the political skills, the experience, the confidence based on past successes and the respect of our partners to enable us to handle these crucially important negotiations in the period immediately ahead in Ireland's very best long-term interests. Can anyone seriously contemplate entrusting such a task to a disparate collection of deputies opposite with our fundamental disagreements on practically every aspect of community affairs? No, 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 I won't try you, I won't try you, the risk would be too great. Irish political life, Camp Corla, is going through a traumatic period Irish political, Irish political, yeah. Irish political life is going through a traumatic period with many disturbing features. The fallout from what has been happening can only be damaging to the best interests of our country. First, we had the disclosure of the reprehensible behaviour of a small number of individuals in the business and financial sector. That by itself was deeply disturbing and seriously detrimental to the good name of this country. But it was added to, hyped up and exaggerated by a massive campaign of vilification and character assassination of unprecedented intensity, intensity without regard to evidence, proof or justification. A totally unjustified attempt was made to put the blame for business scandals onto the government when clearly there was no ministerial involvement of any kind. Yeah, yeah. The business and financial scandals in the semi-state sector, in which the government were in no way involved, were seized upon, embellished and twisted in a totally dishonoured manner to smear those who had no connection of any kind with them. Normal, legitimate political debate was discarded. And in its place we have had a campaign of personalised attacks by a way of unfounded allegations, innuendo, accusation of guilt by association and all the other traditional despicable weapons of such a campaign. The object of the campaign, the object of the campaign was nothing less than to undermine and destabilize this government and to damage the credibility of individual members, particularly myself. Each time there is some new so-called sensational revelation members of the public could well ask themselves the simple question, where is there any evidence of wrongdoing by any member of this government? In the nature of things, it is always easy to raise doubts, questions and suspicions about the motives for even the most laudable actions. I believe all fair-minded responsible citizens should ask why such a campaign was undertaken at this stage and what can be the real motives of those who have participated in this truly extraordinary campaign, this concentrated barrage covering the entire media as one-sided as it was unremitting. I stated at the outset of these events that these were business and financial scandals, not political, and that there was no ministerial or political involvement, and I repeat that. I now wish to firmly reiterate that statement. Nothing that has emerged or been revealed since to affect in any way the truth of that statement. I warmly welcome this debate and the opportunity it gives me to state categorically that neither I nor any of the ministers of this government had any connection of even the remotest kind with any of the events and transactions now being investigated in regard to Irish Sugar and Telecom Erin. I and my colleagues eagerly await the outcome of all the investigations now underway so that the truth can be fully established and revealed and our position vindicated. It will then be shown that neither I or any minister of this government was in any way involved or connected with these events and transactions. 
The House is well used to false allegations by a number of deputies from what is called the left. But on this occasion, a new peddler of this kind of stuff, the leader of the Fine Gael party, Deputy John Bruton, decided apparently to take his ignoble part. He threw himself into the disreputable campaign with a kind of erratic frenzy, popping up all over the place, making unfounded allegations and demanding contradictory courses of action. Perhaps this is not as surprising as it might seem when we recall that it was under this new leader of Fine Gael who devoted the main trust of his vaudeville Ardèche to a vulgar course attack on one single Fianna Fáil deputy. Deputy Bruton. Deputy Bruton. Deputy Bruton. Deputy Bruton is largely responsible for bringing the practice of politics in this country to a new low. He seems to be running Fine Gael as some sort of private detective agency, hunting every latest rumour, phoning around, inquiring about ministers' activities, their families and their friends. It might be Deputy Bruton's style, but it's not the Fine Gael tradition. The present campaign, they have the nothing. That is a deliberate falsehood. That is another deliberate falsehood. Keep shouting, keep shouting. The present campaign, the substitute for thinking. Can, last can call it, last can call it, deputies opposite, deputies opposite have unrestrained access to all the media for three weeks for a month to make all the allegations. Now they won't, now, last can call it, they are not now prepared. They don't like the truth. They are not now prepared to give me one hour. They are not now prepared to give me one hour to reply. Uh, sorry, sorry, Taoiseach. Deputy Taoiseach, come on, let's go. Deputy, Deputy Barrett, if I were you, I wouldn't Deputy participate Bruton, in this debate. Come on, let's go, Come on, let's go. If I were you, don't, I wouldn't participate in this debate. Come on, let's go, Lahishi. We'll, we'll, we'll be talking about your friends. I'll tell you who they are. Frank Conway, your business partner. That's what I'm talking about.